All right, folks, I know you're excited to learn about weather data. I've been told you're excited to learn about weather data. Uh, I'm going to do the first few slides. Tina's going to take over for the ones that require intelligence. And I'm going to come back at the end. OK, uh, remember that VFR uh, ordinarily is a ceiling of um, 1,000 feet or more and visibility of three statute miles or more. That's one of the few things in aviation that's uh, reported in statute miles is visibility. Uh, as Tina mentioned earlier, a ceiling is a broken or overcast layer. Um, or sometimes if it's really nasty, you'll see a vertical visibility reported. Uh, so here are some of the abbreviations that you might see on the right in a METAR. Uh, remember these weather minimums. So, you know, as VFR pilots, we're looking at the weather reports to see if we're going to be able to maintain these cloud clearances and generally stay out of the clouds. So I wanted to tell you um, that it's not quite as hard as you might think because computer programs make a lot of what you're going to learn about uh, simpler. On the other hand, we want to give you the good fundamentals because what we're going to show you, these are the basis of what these computer programs are uh, presenting to you. They're oftentimes getting the same data and uh, spinning it in some uh, interesting graphical way. So we're going to show you uh, all the fundamental text weather that people have been relying on since at least the 50s. There are weather graphics you can grab on the web or sometimes in flight. How do you get the weather on the ground, and how do you get it in the air? So um, most of what you're going to see in the uh, rest of this presentation can actually be summarized by clever uh, programmers. And uh, I think the cleverest programmer of all is this guy, David Boozer, who uh, taught the class last year. Um, and uh, unfortunately, he's uh, taking a jet type, well, fortunately for him, he's taking a jet type rating course right now. So he couldn't be with us. But here is weather spork. Um, if you want to ever have a good illustration of the value of an MBA and studying marketing, uh, just think about the name for this product of weather spork. Uh, let's say we want to go from Bedford to the Gaithersburg, Maryland airport. It's going to show us, uh, this was, I think, from Sunday evening. It's pretty nasty here at Bedford. I believe that's low IFR, that purple. Um, and then here's marginal VFR, marginal VFR. Uh, actually, sorry, maybe, maybe the blue is VFR. That's the problem with color codes. Uh, anyway, you get these symbols for VFR, marginal VFR, IFR, and low IFR. Uh, but here, here's the altitude. We're going from uh, sea level up to 11,000 feet or 12,000 feet at the top. It shows you inside this blue area where the freezing levels are. It's kind of a weird mixed up situation here where there's a freezing level here, another freezing level here. There's air mets. It looks pretty scary. Once we get down closer to the DC area, it's not so bad. There's only, uh, one, <laughs> there's only one air met. And it looks like we could be you know, in the clear of the clouds up here. But this is a good way to summarize it. This already shows you that um, it's probably not going to be wise uh, to go on Sunday at, uh, I guess this was Sunday at 1 PM. OK. Uh, here, notice on the bottom, the time keeps changing. So we're going from Sunday at 1 PM. Uh, the middle uh, screen capture is to go at Sunday at uh, 10 PM. This is at Eastern time. And the last one is to go Monday at 8.30. So you can see from this already that uh, you, know, you could take off from Hanscom Field, uh, rise up to 1,500 feet or so uh, on the right, and just cruise along, never even uh, getting inside a cloud until you landed at Gaithersburg. That's kind of a low altitude. So you might end up deciding, well, what I really want to do is you know, find a hole and go up to about seven or 8,000 feet and go on top of it all and come back down. But whatever. It looks like you could probably remain clear of clouds, make it to your destination. You're not uh, going to pass through a lot of air mets. Over here, let's look at this one in the middle, because it's not quite as terrifying. There's a low turbulence low from the surface all the way up to 18,000 feet. Uh, if it says you know, a turbulence air that goes up to 8,000, that's kind of normal. 
and oftentimes if you climb, climb to four, five, or six, it'll smooth out. But if the turbulence is forecast to go all the way up into the flight levels, you know that's a pretty ugly day. They're saying there's going to be low-level wind shear from zero to 2,000 feet. There's going to be IFR conditions, uh, and it's going to be gusting 18 knots. So all of that's pretty bad, uh, unless you really have to go. Here, look, icing from the freezing level up to flight level 230. Just uh, a collection of hazards. And but think about, but also look at how, look at the difference between Sunday and Monday. You know, if you just hang out on the ground and you're patient, you don't need a superior level of skill if you have a superior level of judgment. Uh, here's some more presentations from Weatherspork. Again, I kind of love this app. Uh, you have all the airports you're going to fly near. So you go from Bedford to Worcester, some places in Connecticut. Um, I think that's uh, Morristown in New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, Lancaster. Anyway, um, on the way to Gaithersburg. And it shows you, here's your time of departure. You're going to depart. But hey, look, it would just get to be, I guess that is, that does mean, yeah, blue must be marginal VFR. And then green, it's going to be windy, but it'll be nice VFR weather. So if we just wait a little bit, we won't have to fly through any areas that are challenging. Uh, ForeFlight has a mode where uh, you can ask for your weather briefing in a PDF format. And this is the first page of that PDF format. It shows some of the same ideas. There are these graphics, these blue uh, half, uh, half moons, if you will, uh, for icing. You can see there's a key down here. It says icing severity. So up here, you've got uh, varying degrees of ice. You probably don't want to be up there in an aircraft like the Cirrus that doesn't have de-icing capability. Uh, so now I think it's uh, all up to Tina to talk about the exciting world of uh, actual weather data. All right, so we're going to talk about um, weather data in the form of reports as well as forecasts. So what is the difference between a report and a forecast? So a report is actually telling you what's actually happening. So it's a current um, weather condition at a particular location. A forecast is you know, a forecast. So it's a guess as to what is going to happen. So it's really important to know the difference between these. Um, we now have uh, Mark Nathanson up in the, in the back who's going to be talking to you at four about some really cool stuff. And as we talked about, he's an FAA examiner. Probably doesn't remember this, but he asked me during my oral exam, you know, how do I, uh, you know, for, for a given piece of weather data, is that a report or a forecast? And if it's a forecast, how much should I rely on that or depend on that? And so that's something to really keep in mind, the difference between knowing what the actual situation is and what somebody guesses the situation is going to be. And uh, you know, of course, depending how far out that guess is, it may or may not actually turn out to be true. So a METAR is a, is a report. And so it's time stamped. So it'll tell you the weather at a particular time in a particular location. And one thing that's important to think about when you think about direction is the way that the wind is reported. So if you hear it, so like if you're listening to the ATIS, we talked about the ATIS quite a bit, so you tune in the ATIS frequency and you listen to it, they're going to be telling you um, that wind direction in magnetic. If you read it on a printed um, document, it's pretty much uh, always a true heading. And uh, certainly on the internet, as we'll give you some sources, that's like the same as uh, reading it. We already covered uh, ceiling, so I won't get into that. So let's just talk about the breakdown of a METAR report. So I, I discussed that generally, um, for example, at Bedford, you might hear the METAR updated every hour or so. And we talked about the identifier, right, that you know, this is information whiskey. Maybe an hour later, it's um, you know, the next as they keep going through the alphabet. And one time that you might see it updated more frequently than once every hour or so is if they need to do a special report. And so that's the other type of acronym that you see there, S-P-E-C-I. And that's if the weather is changing um, a lot. That's usually a bad thing. It's usually, you know, you don't like weather changing frequently. Uh, it's probably not something you want to be flying in. But maybe the conditions are deteriorating. The wind is, um, you know, the wind or the um, conditions or the ceiling has changed significantly. So they'll update that information. 
So there are a whole bunch of different abbreviations um, when you read these reports. I highlighted a couple in red. Um, you know, you can make your way through sort of guessing, okay, thunderstorms is TS, it seems kind of intuitive, but I highlighted some that are really, <laughs> really kind of get you. So hail is GR and mist is BR, as someone was pointing out on this side. Yeah, so mists, you know, if you just look at it and you try to think, oh, is it broken? No, broken is BKR. So they just try to trick you with that. So try to, try to keep an eye on those. And it's good to refresh your memory on these. So this is an example of a of METAR report. So it you know starts off with the location, and then the first two numbers, the one six, are telling you that it's the sixteenth day of the month, and then it's followed by sixteen fifty three. So that's the time, and it has a Z for time in Zulu. We already talked about how you. Um, you know, subtract hours depending on Eastern time, Standard Time versus Daylight Time to get to the current time. And then instead of telling you a heading of the wind, in this case it has variable. So sometimes it'll say wind's variable at about four knots in this case. And then the next is the visibility. So 10 SM is standing for 10 statute miles. And then in this case the ceiling is overcast. Overcast at 6,000. The next two numbers, you, the, so you see the 14 slash 07. So that's talking about the uh, temperature and the dew point. So who remembers what is dew point? Yes. Temperature where um, the air reaches saturation. So we hear the temperature where the air reaches saturation for water. So what happens when the dew point and the temperature are very close to each other? So here there, you know, we have seven uh, degrees Celsius for dew point, 14 degrees Celsius for temperature. What if the dew point and the temperature were, were much closer, only a couple degrees apart? Yes? Clouds would form. Yeah, it can be very humid. You could be inside of a cloud or having fog or precipitation. Exactly. So here's a, um, a good source of weather information. So you can go to aviationweather.gov, and they have a bunch of menu options up there. So if you click on METAR um, right here, this METAR button, it'll take you to a place where you can request the METAR data. And so it asks for an ID, so that's the um, airport identifier. So in this case, I wrote in KBED, which is Bedford Airport Hanscom Field that we keep referring to. And then you can actually tell it to decode the data for you. Um, so as much as you want to memorize all of these different codes and symbols, um, in general practice, you can hit decoded and it'll tell you that. Uh, you can look up a, the time, so you can actually ask for weather data in the past. And you can include a TAF. What does TAF mean? Yes? Terminal area forecast. Terminal area forecast, that's right. So if you do that um, and you, you hit enter, it gives you this data. So uh, first thing it does is it tells you the date at which it's producing the data for you. And then um, the first is the METAR, and the second here is the TAF. And so the METAR here is telling you the location. So it starts with KBED. And then um, here is the information raw. So you see that uh, data right here. Or you can have it decoded. So again, the first two numbers, two, three, that's the date, 20, 23rd, and then it gives you the time in Zulu, um, and then they, they basically go forward with all that information. So it, it's defined it here because it's decoded, so you see you know, the temperature dew point. So I actually just updated this this morning so you could see the, the weather and what it's looking like. Now I'll go over um, to the document viewer for a moment. Oh, you probably don't want the light. Or maybe we, we probably need this. OK. Qualified personnel are here. I'll entertain you. That first meet chart was from PDK. Anybody know where that, what air, where, where that is? KPDK. Can you push this power button? Southerners. DeKalb, yeah, it's Peachtree DeKalb in Atlanta. It's the uh, Teterboro or Hanscom Field of Atlanta. 
turn it off. I landed there once in a Diamond Star. I don't know. That had, know uh, I had to have the wings Ring. taken off in uh, Florida to fix a fuel gauge. I took off from there, and I filed a VFR flight plan, landed at DeKalb, there you go. and I forgot to close my VFR flight it plan. It displayed for a second. So the FAA, uh, our flight service folks at the time, they start searching for me and calling everybody. And they called the tower at DeKalb, and they said, hey, did you see uh, 505 Whiskey Tango? And they said, no, we haven't seen that airplane. <laughs> so they really freaked out. That's exactly what I wanted And it was right there on the ramp. Um, so, uh, and I, I, I kept silencing my phone because I was at a uh, barbecue place with my friend and didn't want to be disturbed. Anyway, so they, had, they called the mechanic who took the wings off, and they told him, like, the aircraft was missing. It was pretty, he was pretty, uh, he had some choice words for me. So now whenever I uh, activate a VFR flight plan, usually I fly, you know, if I do a flight plan at all, it's IFR and they close it out for you automatically. I move my watch from my left wrist to my right as a reminder to close the flight plan. All right, Tina, take it away. So this is um, the ForeFlight app. I've passed the iPad around a couple times, so I think you guys have gotten to play with it. This is just a setting where the blue dot is showing where we currently are, and I've actually overlaid um, one of those instrument flight plans on top um, going here. So this is a, an instrumented approach to Bedford. But if I wanted to get this weather data here, I can go to airports and pull up the airport that I'm looking for, and then you know click on this weather, and it shows me the um, the METAR. So it has both the raw data there, and then it depicts it. And again, blue is showing marginal VFR, and so it explains that. What's also nice is it tells you um, the weather at nearby airports as well. And then you can also go to your uh, TAF, your terminal area forecast, and you can look at how that is changing over time. Oh, Tina, if you don't mind, click on MOS also. Yeah, if you're planning travel, MOS is good because it gives you weather a few days in advance so you can decide whether or not it makes sense to depart here on Friday and hope to come back VFR on Sunday. MOS is talking about the models, so the weather models and what the outputs are. I think it stands for model output statistics. Not very helpful. But anyway, it's a longer for flight and Garmin Pilot and some other sources like WeatherSpork will turn that into a uh, sort of a virtual TAF for you that uh, lasts uh, three days instead of just 24 hours or 30 for the big airports. So another type of weather report is a PIREP, or a pilot report. And so this is um, where a pilot could be flying and wants to report the conditions. So for example, turbulence or icing. Those are types of things that are um, re frequently reported by pilots. And you can actually report one as well. So um, one time when you're getting your, your flight instruction, if you do notice uh, wind shear, turbulence, uh, icing, um, try to see if you can actually uh, provide your own PIREP, and it'll ask you certain information, such as your location, the time, the altitude at which you experienced it, what type of aircraft. I think that's really relevant because, for example, uh, wind shear experienced by a small Cessna is one thing. If a large aircraft, uh, like a big jet, a jet blue aircraft, is telling you that they have wind shear, I'd really pay attention <laughs> if they seem to have trouble with it. That means you're definitely going to have trouble with it. Um, and then you can also have printed weather forecasts that tell you, so we just talked about the TAF as an example. And uh, as Philip was just saying, it only goes out 24 hours. So, um, you know, same type of information as a METAR and similar abbreviations. And then we were just talking about that, uh, those models, and so you can forecast even farther out if need be. You can also get a forecast for a general area. So this is what uh, we were discussing earlier when we were talking about radios, and you might want to call in and uh, ask for uh, kind of a weather forecast or a weather brief for a given flight plan. We talked about how you'd call in, kind of give your tail number, where you were starting, where you were going, about how much time you thought you'd be um, en route or in flight. And then they might tell you the weather for the general area as well as the local um, you know, current readings as well as the forecast. And yeah, notice that these area forecasts, if you go to the page on aviationweather.gov, they're now only available for two or three regions, like the Gulf of Mexico. They used to have them 
you know, for uh, all over the continental U.S. and they included cloud tops, which was very useful to forecast top of the cloud because if it was say 4,000 feet, you would know that if you get, as long as you get on top of those IFR, you're not going to pick up any ice because uh, you'll be above the clouds. And now you have to try to tease that out of uh, the uh, MOS data sources or use something like Weather Spork that tries to depict graphically where the uh, clouds are. I think Four Flight's profile view will also try to do some of that. Um, you can also get forecasts of winds aloft. We've talked about that a couple times. And so this will um, tell you kind of what the winds are going to be at a particular altitude. And you might, um, for example, at 3,000 feet or 6,000 feet. And so you can, um, it helps you estimate, especially in a cross-country flight or a longer flight, how long it might take for you to get there. Um, on, on apps such as ForeFlight, if you, um, in fact, we'll just, we'll just do that right now so you can see. So you can actually enter in a sort of a flight plan very quickly. So you can have a, a starting a starting place, and then um, so where do you guys want to fly to? Boston. That's a pretty short flight, but sure. <laughs> You guys, if you have the patience to stay with us tomorrow afternoon, starting at 3 o'clock, the founder of Four Flight is going to be here. And I'm sure you'll get a pretty uh, thorough demo. He's going to, he and the colleague are going to talk for a couple hours about, you know, first the app and also the startup and then uh, some of the engineering behind it. So the blue dot is showing where we are here at MIT. Um, but of course, generally, you'd be doing this when you're at, at Bedford and you're flying to, to Logan. Um, and then here it's telling you uh, it wants to know about the aircraft that I'll be flying in order to calculate some of the, some of the information. Um, but when, when you do these types of things with the flight, it can estimate kind of how long you'll be in flight. And, when you, and you can provide what is the um, altitude at which you want to fly. And then it will be able to, so it says coloring based on winds aloft, but looks like it's not detecting that maybe because I haven't given it all of its data right now. So in terms of what that means is just that the, the winds aloft are a good way of helping you predict how long it's going to take you to get to certain places. And it'll be part of the cross-country planning that you have to do. The winds aloft forecast also shows you the uh, temperature, which is critical, because that's going to uh, tell you whether icing is icing's not uh, possible if it's above freezing, generally. There are also a bunch of severe weather reports. Um, Philip has already talked about a number of them, um, air mets and sig mets, as he was talking about. So here's, um, you know, and then they, they have different abbreviations, so even more abbreviations related to this, so what, um, what they mean for icing and turbulence. So here we'll look at some examples of an air met. And in the picture, kind of it shows a broad area where that air met is valid. And so this is talking about icing and freezing level. This this is a, um, so SIGMETs um, also talk about hazard, hazardous weather such as icing, uh, turbulence, um, volcanic ash, which I don't think you'll encounter very often, <laughs> but you know, it was an issue in, in Europe, for example. And then here's a breakdown of decoding a SIGMET uh, as an example to show you the type of, type of information, what it stands for, and, and you, know, you can read through these to understand the adverse weather. And certainly, if you're planning your own cross-country flight, I recommend you also use your normal weather data sources as well. So just turn on the Weather Channel or weather.com or AccuWeather, whatever you, you use on a regular basis. If it's a crummy day, it's probably not a good day to go fly anyway, and you may not want to dive so deep into all of these different uh, tools. But if it seems uh, like a nice day, then I would really recommend diving more specifically into understanding if there's a front coming in or other types of issues. And then uh, convective SIGMETs are really, uh, really concerning. So there, there are things that are much more severe. So you're talking about thunderstorms, hail, some things you really don't want to be flying during at all. 
There's a lot of different ways that the weather is also produced, not in a text form, but in a graphical format. So this is a, a relatively complicated weather uh, depiction chart. So we'll break it down in detail, but let me just tell you some of the main things. Do you have the, oh, I left it over there. Thanks, Philip. So can anyone guess what all the little circles are? We see some circles that are white and some circles that are black. Does anyone know what those are? Any guesses? Weather stations? Um, good guess. So it's actually trying to tell you what the cloud cover is like. So you can see um, certain places where there is um, the circle is empty is that there's um, it's a clear day when it's fully um, filled in that it's showing the cloud cover and then you see some that are like little pie charts so that they're partially filled in. So the, the purpose of um, looking at a weather chart like that is just to get the, the general conditions. Um, there's a lot of different things. So here it, it's more specific. So it's, you know breaks down that the circles indicate the percent cloud cover. So if it's a quarter filled, it's saying few clouds. If it's three quarters filled, it's broken. Um, and then it also has shaded areas that depict what the, uh, when you have the IFR conditions. So zooming in, you can just kind of see um, those circles a little bit bigger, and the charts provide a lot of information as well. But you can see a little bit more clearly also here um, some of the circles that are like pie charts that showing how much they're filled in and what the, what the cloud cover is looking like. And uh, again, you can actually get the same type of thing on your uh, for flight. It's basically an option for every airport that it depicts. It can show this cloud cover as well. You can also look at a radar summary chart. There are a bunch of prog charts, so they talk about um, when you're looking at a front. You've seen, you guys have seen a lot of these things on the on the Weather Channel. Probably didn't pay attention to them very much, but it's good to understand what the different types of fronts are, what's happening across the country, um, more than just your particular region. So if you're planning, you know, if it's a um, I think today's a Wednesday, so if you're planning on a flight this upcoming weekend and you want to think about what's going to happen, basically you're trying to see are there some fronts coming in, what's happening, or is it likely to going to be a clear day? Um, and then, of course, as we've talked about, all of these have uh, good legends, just like we talked about the um, sectional chart quite a bit and the details of the legend. It's always good to, to take a look at how they have um, indicated these different lines, where the fronts are, and you really want to know which ones, again, are reporting the actual conditions versus which is a, um, a guesstimate of what's going to happen in six hours, 12 hours from now. Again, if it's a forecast, it could be wrong. And then this is just a little bit more detail of types of things you can see on a chart. I think the most important thing to look at is this, this weird little R symbol with kind of an arrow at the bottom. It's, uh, it's indicating thunder. So that's a big, a big one to look out for. If you see that, it's probably not something you're interested in flying in. I'm not, for sure. And then um, there are a couple charts here that are not specifically on the um, you know, usually going to be asked about, but it's good to see. So you might have seen these kind of surface analysis charts, and they talk about high pressure areas and low pressure areas. And so that high and low pressure, what are we talking about? So that's that's the same thing as that pressure that you're dialing into your altimeter, right? So we talked about um, 29.92, but you know there might be a day where it's really dropped very low, and it's it's 28 or something, very very low. That means you're in a low pressure area, and if it's very high, you know, you're at 30 uh, point something, you know, it's a higher higher pressure area. And if you see that as you're flying around that, that that pressure setting is getting updated very rapidly and changing rapidly, that usually is related to a change in your overall weather system. So you really want to be aware if that number is changing quite a bit, uh, that's a big, a big problem. You can also take a look at when you get into your airplane and you're first setting that dial when you're sitting on the ground, you know, see how much it's changing. 
It might, uh, and you might want to, in general, when you get into a plane, I like to think about when the plane was last flown. You can, um, there are parts where you are checking the oil that you can kind of generally feel the engine and see if it's warm or not, if it needs to be primed or not, those types of things. If you see that the plane has just been flown and you're really dramatically having to change that pressure setting, that means the weather has recently changed quite a bit. It makes you want to really make sure that your um, projections and your knowledge about the weather is still accurate. Tim, you want to mention these, these numbers here are the metric uh, equivalents. So instead of 299 or 2, you'll see uh, you know, 1,000 millibars or so. So we have a, a bunch of these. You can, and all of these are also on that first website, the aviationweather.gov. You can look at, um, you know, actually seeing the the clouds from a satellite picture and kind of just seeing what what's going on. You know, these aren't these are hopefully not the first time you've seen these types of charts before. And then this is a, a way that they like to uh, depict the winds aloft. So these little lines, and then depending on how many um, lines are coming off the side, um, it indicates how you know how strong that wind is and what the what the amount is. So you can see here some that have a lot of little dashes coming off of it, whereas some that don't have any. It's a way to very quickly see where the wind is very strong and where it's not. And this is what I had talked about last time when we were in the radio um, section, the radio ATC and communication section. But uh, just as a reminder, this is the number that you can call, and you can get your full full weather briefing done there. Can you want me to take over now? Sure. This is... All right. So um, thank you. Tina covered the uh, stuff that requires a brain. Now I'm going to just tell you about uh, you know how do you how do you get this stuff as a practical matter? Uh, you can call this phone number. It's very good when you're a uh, novice pilot. Uh, again, think about crew resource management. The uh, weather briefers uh, are another person that you can pull in. They may say VFR flight not recommended. That's there at the bottom. That's worth paying attention to. Um, they uh, used to work for the FAA. They were outsourced in 2005, and now they're contractors from a company called Lidos. So you might hear the name Lidos. Uh, you can get a full weather briefing over the phone. I actually do this sometimes if I'm, if I'm in Ann Huber uh, on my way to the Gaithersburg Airport, I'll just call the weather briefer. Um, and uh, that makes life very easy. OK, so aviationweather.gov, as we mentioned earlier, has all the charts that we uh, saw. The weather briefers themselves run their own website, which is a little bit of a twist on that. I kind of like this site, actually because you get to set up a home page where you pick your favorite airport. So I picked Bedford, Teterboro, which is where you go uh, in the uh, New York metro area if you enjoy paying uh, 8 or $9 a gallon for gasoline, uh, and then Dulles Airport, uh, where the two, the two competing FBOs also charge about $9 a gallon for gasoline. But anyway, they'll have uh, the METARs for your favorite airports and the TAFs. <laughs> And all this, and these, you can set up these charts. So basically, uh, as soon as you log in, you get a whole bunch of current weather information. That's kind of a nice feature for this this website, and it is free. They will give you, uh, just like uh, aviationweather.gov, they'll give you the METAR. Here's one for Bedford from the other day. I guess that's from the 21st. Yeah, uh, the wind was 310, so it was on the 21st at uh, 0256 Zulu. So it was late at night. Um, early in the morning in London. Wind was 310 at 18 knots, gusting 25, 10 miles of visibility clear. Temperature was minus 11, dew point minus 19er, altimeter 29er, 47. And there's a remark the peak wind was 310 at 31 knots, and that happened at uh, 0225 Zulu time. Okay, there are private websites. Uh, the most popular free one is probably flightplan.com, at least among the turbine crowd. They have very accurate uh, models for a lot of jet-powered or turboprop aircraft. And uh, they have some example briefings that I think I do want to show you. OK. Uh, Again, you'll, you'll have access to this. So one nice thing about uh, flightplan.com is they start you off with a nav log. Remember we talked about that? Uh, and in the nav log, they tell you uh, what magnetic 
course to steer. Or sorry, they give you the magnetic course. Sorry, magnetic course is 303. I guess they don't give you the wind correction angle. Or maybe the wind's right in our faces. No, it's not. Maybe this is not such a great sight. <laughs> All right, well anyway, they tell you roughly how long it's gonna take you to get there. Um, and they will calculate your ground speed for you. Uh, so I think I put it in a Piper Warrior or something. So this is a pretty low uh, air speed, 124 knots. And uh, you can see uh, at the different altitudes um, how much fuel you're going to burn and how long it's going to take you. So it's really, there's really not a lot of difference. You can see here you could go at 10,000 feet and take 58 minutes. You could go at 4,500 feet and it would take you an hour. So there's not a lot to choose from. Uh, your airspeed goes up a little bit as you climb higher, but the wind is also a little bit stronger. Uh, they're giving you the weather to go from Bedford to Bennington, Vermont, giving you a little bit of information about the runways. You can look at the approaches there. Uh, departure aircraft, aircraft airport forecast. So look at this, departure airport NOTAMs. They did a pretty good job here. They pulled out the most important NOTAM. They were doing snow clearing. So Bedford, they said, look, runway 1129 is closed, except with one hour of prior permission to this phone number. So how about that? Look at all those other NOTAMs. You can really get lost, because they're telling you about stuff. You know, taxiway. Here, let's go here. Taxiway November, edge markings obscured. Maybe by the snow, I don't know why. Anyway, that's probably not really important. Uh, that maybe is a taxiway that you're not even gonna use. Um, so uh, this is actually a pretty good computer program, I think, because they put that closed runway NOTAM right up at the top where you might actually see it, and they put it in boldface. Anyway, so that's a uh, flightplan.com weather briefing. Let's see how ForeFlight presents the same information. You saw that before. They also give you this uh, wind temperature and turbulence. Oh, this is a for, to a different spot. This is to Gaithersburg. Uh, significant weather from flight level 250 to 630. Not going to be able to use that in the Cirrus, unfortunately. Um, that's up above 25,000 feet. We get the METARs, it looks like, uh, sorry, the, the METARs and TAFs. So we get our uh, METAR for Hanscom, and it looks like they put in boldface the relevant portion of the TAF. So they're saying, look, at your flight time, this is the one that's going to apply. It's going to be better than six miles of visibility, but overcast at 800. So not a bad IFR situation, as long as you can handle any icing. Uh, they've color-coded a bunch of stuff. So uh, you can see here at Worcester, they've got, uh, well, that looks pretty nasty. Uh, they're forecasting, for example, wind 030 at 11 knots, only half a mile of visibility. Tina, help me out. What's minus PL? Freezing fog. I don't know what minus PL is, but it sounds bad. Overcast 500. So they're calling that low IFR. Uh, where are the NOTAMs? Let me see what they did with the NOTAMs. I think it was the same day. PL is ice pellets. Ice pellets, okay. Well, we don't want that. So this is an interesting thing. Four flight kind of missed. I think it was out there. Maybe it's here. Okay, so up at the top it says runway 523 is closed, which normally wouldn't bother me at all because that's the crosswind runway and we don't like to use it unless we have to. Uh, maybe that NOTAM was not out at the time that I got this one. Yeah, there's, no, there's nothing about that PPR. I guess they hadn't started plowing the snow at that time. Anyway, so the NOTAMs are important. They can tell you if the uh, airport is having some kind of construction going on. Uh, mobile apps, uh, ForeFlight is for the iPhone or iPad only. Uh, that's a major difference between ForeFlight and Garmin Pilot. NavMonster is a fun free app. It works at least on iOS, I think on Android as well. That gives you a lot of good stuff. Uh, WeatherSpork is 
um, all three plat platforms. So we're just going to show you four flight in case you're not able to come to the uh, talk tomorrow starting at 3. Here's a little flavor of a uh, four flight. Um, notice that in the airport information page here on the left, uh, they highlight the fact that runway 523 is closed by NOTAM, so they're making an attempt to pull out the most significant runways. But actually, they missed one. Look at this. Runway 1129 is also closed, except for this one hour prior permission. Somehow that exception uh, you know, didn't get the software excited. So if you showed up, actually, this is a good example of when you might want to run your minimum um, uh, fuel burn, uh, maximum endurance airspeed. So you get to the airport and uh, you didn't check the NOTAMs, or maybe it was a newly issued NOTAM, and they tell you the runway is closed and it won't reopen for another half hour. Uh, so in that case, you know, you're going to go out and loiter somewhere until the airport reopens, uh, unless you want to land somewhere else. Okay, uh, the next page is apparently about NOTAMs, and over on the right we have the weather, which Tina already showed you. And you see the density altitude? Look at that. It's minus 2,500 feet. Um, it's 2,500 feet below sea level at uh, Hanscom Field. Uh, Four Flight can give you the TAF and the MOS, as I show, said. So uh, this was, I think, on Sunday. And uh, have a look there. We're getting the weather for Wednesday. So we can plan our trip to return. What's today, Wednesday? And look, the MOS is pretty right. It's nice. It's uh, not too much wind, 190 at 5 knots, overcast above 12, below 12,000. Here's Garmin Pilot. Garmin really believes in the uh, old white on black, uh, like a 1970s monitor. Um, Foreflight will actually flip into sort of a style like this at nighttime. Um, and this one, uh, it doesn't highlight for you. It's the same time as I was using four flight, and nowhere in here does it highlight that that runway 523 is closed or that 29er is having any kind of issue. I think it was the same time. I could be wrong. Yeah, see, 523 closed, runway 1129 closed except one hour prior permission. So you're fat, dumb, and happy looking at this page, getting all ready to go to Hanscom Field. And then if you don't check the NOTAMs, you discover that there's uh, no runway. So another good reason to always have some re reserve fuel and not overcommit to your uh, plan. All right, in-flight weather sources. Uh, there's something called T-Web, transcribed weather broadcasts. You might be asked about it on the uh, exam. I doubt it. Um, anyway, in that old, uh, that's my friend Eric, again, with his DC-3. If you were flying a DC-3 in its prime, you might have heard of T-Web. Uh, HIWAS is still being broadcast off of certain VORs that are indicated on the chart. So look at this. See that H symbol there in the middle? That H symbol tells you that if you tune in to this VOR and tell your audio panel in the airplane that you want to actually listen to whatever's being modulated, uh, that you'll hear this uh, uh, pre-recorded weather announcement about uh, maybe thunderstorms in a certain area. You can call flight service en route. They're very uh, helpful. They'll take a pirate from you, and they'll tell you what is going on. They can call your mom if you're going to be late due to uh, uh, forecast headwinds. I was actually flying through New York uh, on my way to DC, and there were horrible headwinds. I was in a Diamond Star, which is not a very fast airplane. So when you've got a 50-knot headwind, you slow down to uh, Honda Accord speeds. Uh, so I asked New York for a frequency change to flight service, and they said, well, why do you need it? And I said, well, I want to have them call my mom and uh, tell her I'm going to be late. And they said, oh, we can do that for you. <laughs> so in between vectoring the Airbuses uh, out to Germany, they were uh, calling my mom. I think each controller in New York has an assistant right next to him or her, and uh, that was who actually made the phone call. Uh, so you just a quick note, um, the last point there, so flight service can accept your PI rep. So when we talked about how you should make a pilot report or a PI rep, you can call them and tell them, hey, I experienced turbulence. I think if it's really ugly, you can, the controllers uh, can also put it in, like if it's icing or... Wind, um, wind shear, they usually accept because wind shear is such a bad thing, and you're fighting the wind shear and trying to deal with the wind shear, so they'll usually accept that PI rep. Uh, all right, next rad. So in, uh, this, is actually, this is an actual photo of our Cirrus screen on our way to Oshkosh. So remember I showed you that one earlier, which was the track from FlightAware. 
So we had planned to go from Rutland, Vermont. Oh, sorry, we had planned. We had planned, I guess, yeah, we, we, we came up with a new plan. We really wanted to go from Bedford over to Syracuse. Uh, and I think initially we decided that going to Rutland would uh, keep us away from the uh, rain. Radar, remember, the, radar, the next rad radar, what they're really seeing is water in the clouds. So they can, uh, they can actually see rain. They can't see a cloud that's just vapor and is going to uh, produce a uh, rainstorm at some point. They're really seeing the big water droplets of rain. Uh, anyway, so we elected to fly over here and refuel at Watertown, New York, instead of at Syracuse. Oksana was on that flight. We flew through some of that rain, and it actually was pretty smooth. So we probably could have just charged through, but we took a more conservative route. OK, so next rad data, instead of paying for a uh, receiver in your airplane and then paying a subscription fee, the FAA will give you uh, NextRad data, as well as a bunch of other stuff, so like some text weather data. That's another good reason to be able to read METARs, because if you're looking at it in the cockpit, it could be on a pretty small display, and the raw format is very compact and actually very convenient for in-flight use. Um, anyway, here's a little diagram of how it's transmitted. You have to have this, uh, you have to have, let's see if, we, yeah, we talk about this. Yeah, so you have to have a UAT receiver to get these data. The aircraft position, see the big airliner transmitting on 1090 uh, megahertz extended squitter, it's called? Uh, that's fine, um, but you need to be able to receive on 978 megahertz, which is this alternative frequency that I guess had more bandwidth available. And that's where the FAA can push all these data up to you, like about other traffic, even traffic that doesn't comply with ADSB. Although by January 1st of uh, next year, um, you know, almost everybody will have uh, ADSB out at least. Um, anyway, so the, the feds are pushing this stuff up to your airplane. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Tina now to talk about. Yeah, so I just added in this slide, this is the one that we had been talking about. Um, if you want, if you're in a uh, plane that does not have the ADSB receiver, but you want to receive that information so that you get uh, real time weather information or real time traffic information, you can actually make that happen by building it yourself. And I did that. It really doesn't take very long. Um, if you, if you want to seem really cool, you can go and buy the, uh, you know, just a regular Raspberry Pi and a couple different parts. Um, also, that link will show you how you can just buy a little kit where they've put everything together and you just buy it. It's very easy to assemble. Um, so it just has a little Raspberry Pi inside, and it has a little cooling fan, and then it has these antennas. The Stratix software is actually um, kind of free open source software, and it's really great, and it syncs up to your to your other apps. So for example, with ForeFlight, um, it just shows up like a, a Wi-Fi signal that you connect to. And then while you're in the air, when you don't have um, access to this data, this will actually update. So you can see um, on the right is kind of a, a zoomed in picture from ForeFlight. So it shows that you, know, you can see kind of the weather on the bottom left corner. And then you also see these little um, these little pictures that show traffic. So, yeah, so exactly. So on the, in the farther bottom right, you can also see, so it just shows you other, other airplanes, other traffic, and kind of the altitude that they're at. And so it's really useful. I think it's kind of nice to have, uh, especially in a little airplane, to have that visibility and knowledge so you're not just relying on um, flight service giving, or a, kind of like a area controller giving you traffic advisories, but you can see it in advance. Um, we're about to, dive into human factors, and Philip has talked a lot about using um, the person sitting next to you, whether they are actually a pilot or just a friend. Uh, even just a friend can sit there and hold the, hold the iPad and see the little um, blue traffic, and then when they hear on the radio that someone's saying, you know, hey, look, it looks like in this situation, you know, traffic 3 o'clock, you're trying to look for that plane, well, they can have a little sense of, OK, yeah, it's near that. And they, they can help you find the other aircraft. So it's very helpful. How, how much were the parts for that, Tina? It's, it's like $80. OK, yeah. So the ones that you can buy commercially all packaged, like the Stratus, I think this is a play on Stratus, which was one of the competitors in that market. They're anywhere from $400 to $1,000, I think. They, those, the commercial ones also have 
um, an electronic gy uh, gyro in there, an AHARS attitude and heading reference system, so they can actually give you on your iPad uh, an attitude indicator and some information about your speed and so forth. Uh, all right, so this is a reminder that again, you know, all that all those data are intended to help you. Uh, fly within the VFR weather minimums, which provide a good margin of safety. I put this uh, $20 magazine up here for you guys, because this uh, whole talk has really been about software and different ways of spinning the same data. So uh, this is everything, in case you're not a Core 6 major, this is everything you need to know to become a programmer in one $20 magazine. So we're running a little behind, so I'm going to go straight to, to human factors. While I'm pulling it up, let Philip know if you have any more questions. Yeah, anything going on? How do you know when your weather briefing is adequate with all these sources out there and you're not really, I'm not, I'm just I'm not really sure who's pulling data from where. That's a great question. How do you know if your weather briefing is adequate? The, the professional weather briefers at Lidos at 1-800-WX-BRIEF, uh, they tend to go a little above and beyond. They'll give you no TAMs about any VOR that's out of service on your route of flight, even if you're navigating with the GPS. So if you're at all unsure, just you know, do your, do your self-service stuff online, and then just call 1-800-WX-BRIEF and ask for a full briefing. It won't take you more than 10 minutes, and uh, you'll definitely be at least, uh, oh, you'll probably be overbriefed at that point. They'll tell you about an unlit tower, even if you're flying you know, at noon, and it's, uh, you know, there's no possibility of uh, it being dark and the lighting on the tower making a difference. 